Welcome everyone to another edition of Indie Reads Aloud. As I've said so many times on the program, I love having the opportunity to introduce you to new authors and new stories. Today, J.L. Regan is here all the way from New York City, and she's going to read from her book, Secret Desires. As I say, she lives in New York in the New York metropolitan area. She is a published photojournalist, has short suspense stories online, and has taught special education and English as a second language to students around the globe. This is her first contemporary romance. She has also published three nonfiction books. She holds a master in science in business, medical, and technical journalism, as well as two others in ESL and education. She has published on a variety of topics from cochlear implants to the economy and has conducted workshops, domestic and foreign, on the nuances of business communications for managers and startup companies. She is the leader of her own enterprise with training programs for entrepreneurs Um, And she has recently published two books, Jamie is Autistic, Learning in a Special Way, and Go For It Leadership Handbook for All Students. Welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm so glad you could join us today. As I said in the green room, I just love it when people read out loud to me, and I love discovering new stories. Tell me a little bit about why you chose Contemporary Romance as your first novel. I dated someone many years ago, and I, unfortunately, by mutual consent, we agreed that we weren't going to go forward. But when I joined years ago, a little romance group, they said to me, well, it's better if you do something that you have a frame of reference for. And in the book at the end, Things do work out for Edward and Margot. And that's what I wanted. I guess because of the little bit of Cinderella in me, I wanted a happy ending. And Everybody I, loves a happy ending. And also because there are so many lovely ladies out there who have been widowed, who unfortunately have been divorced, who've had all sorts of problems. And I wanted to give them hope that through Edward and Margot, it's possible to take a second chance on love. Spectacular. I just love that. So to tell you a little bit about the story, nothing in Margot Simmons' life came easy. She can't claim the inheritance on a condo apartment her uncle has left her until she is gainfully employed in a job for a year. She meets the man of her dreams, but anguishes over a loving relationship because she is still emotionally tied to his deceased wife. With great difficulty, she becomes the guardian to a recently orphaned child she had been tutoring. Margot evolves from an insecure newbie elementary teacher into a woman determined to fulfill the secret desires locked in her heart. This story speaks to anyone who has suffered a loss and has to start over. This is a fabulous premise for a story. I, I just really love it. I'm really excited to hear what you have to share with us today. What part will you be sharing of this book? Secret I'll be Desires. reading from chapter one. Starting at the beginning is always a great place to begin. So when you are ready, JL, please take the microphone and read aloud. Okay, here we go. Margot Simmons gripped the edges of the leather chair, waiting for details from the family lawyer about her Uncle Harry's death. She hoped it would be shorter and less painful than the reading of her father's will. An older gentleman extended his hand. I'm sorry your mother couldn't be here. Margot looked up from her reflections to acknowledge him. Thanks, Mr. Steinberg. You've grown into a lovely young woman. Margot blanked, blinked back tears at memories of good times shared with Uncle Harry. Not so young, I'm 23. The portly man squeezed himself into a swivel chair and peered at her over wire rim bifocals. I'm ancient compared to that number. Margot gripped her knees to steady her nerves. My mother wanted to come with me, but they're downsizing at her dress shop. She was afraid to leave early. 
My stepfather is furious because Uncle Harry didn't leave him any money. Mr. Steinberg saddened at the sorrowful expression on the young woman's face. It pains me to hear Jerry hasn't changed his ways. However, since you're the only one present to hear your uncle's will, I'll get to the point. Harry has left you his Riverside Drive condominium apartment and the sum of $250,000. Margot jumped up from the chair and hugged the man. This is a miracle. I can't wait to tell my mom. She's wanted me to get out on my own. Now I can, though I wish it hadn't come with the loss of my uncle. I adored him. The attorney pushed by focus up his fleshy nose. I know you did, my dear. He spoke of you often with fondness. As to your inheritance, in today's market, $250,000 won't last long unless invested wisely. The only thing Margot knew about investments was that she didn't have enough money to make any. Mr. Steinberg, can you refer me to someone who is adv can advise me so I can make wise investments? He raised his hand. Not so fast, my dear. Your uncle stipulated that you be gainfully employed for a year before you can claim your inheritance. The last time your mother and I spoke, you were studying to be a French teacher. Margot stared at the vibrant red dragon design on an oriental rug and thought of the threadbare one under her rickety dining room table. Her eyes darted from the lawyer's monogrammed attache case to her worn shoulder strap bag. She swallowed a lump of pride. I've been looking for a teaching job for two years, but I'm on the substitute list and have a part-time job at a dry cleaner. So I'm employed. I know it's not a professional job, but it's respectable work. Mr. Steinberg made notes in his and her uncle's folder. I'm afraid that won't do, my dear. Harry loved you, but was very clear on the type of employment. A tear rolled down Margot's cheek. I don't know how much longer I can live at home. Mama is working twice as hard since Jerry was laid off from his job at the newspaper. He couldn't get the hang of technology. He's been on disability from an old back injury. Could I speak to an investment counselor to get an idea <clears throat> of what to do with my inheritance? It would give me something to strive for. Margot sat on her hands as she waited for the lawyer's response. Since childhood, <clears throat> all she wanted was to be part of a happy family and not have money worries. Instead of granting her wishes, life had brought her a mean stepfather. Jerry fractured, Jerry fractured a childhood that had been filled with love when her birth father was alive. Mr. Steinberg lifted a business card from a sterling silver box. I highly recommend Edward Master. He's with the investment banking firm of Chartwell, Morgan and Master. He'll give you solid advice. Shall I see if he's available now? Margot glanced at her watch. Yes, but this is kind of short notice, isn't it? Your uncle was my good friend. Let's see if Edward Master is available. The attorney lifted the receiver and punched in a number. He explained Margot's situation. She crossed her fingers. A few minutes later, Mr. Steinberg wrote an address on a slip of paper. You're in luck, young lady. Mr. Master has an opening at 11. He checked his watch. It's now 10. It shouldn't take you an hour to walk from Grand Central to 59th and Madison. Mr. Steinberg handed her the paper. Hurry along. Margot stole a glance at her checkbook. She had exactly a hundred dollars. Mr. Steinberg, <clears throat> I don't have enough money for your fee until I get my next paycheck. The lawyer extended his hand. No worries. Harry loved you very much. He's taking care of the legal expenses. I feel like a brute treating you this way, but I must adhere to the terms of your uncle's will. Please be, keep me posted on your job status. The minute you've signed a full-time teaching contract, I will start the paperwork on your inheritance and condo title transfer. Margot grasped the man's fingers. Thank you so much for your help. He leaned closer. Say hello to your mother. Will do. Margot retraced her steps to the elevator and headed for the subway line to take her to Mr. Master's office. She fantasized about a vacation in Italy. She could buy a new couch for the living room. The one she was sleeping on was overdue at the Salvation Army. <laughs> Then there was the dress in Lord and Taylor's window her mother had admired. She'd hoped to do something to reward the woman for all she'd sacrificed to raise Margot, with Jerry absent most of the time. She still needed to pay off her student loans, which were messing up her credit rating. 
Life shouldn't be so complicated at 23. The secret desire she'd locked away in the hope chest of her heart would have to wait a bit longer to be set free. Margot arrived in Edward Masters Madison Avenue office a half hour early. The only the old money Ivy League environment made her uncomfortable. She buried her nose in the latest issue of Teacher's Journal. Maybe this wasn't a good idea. She retraced her steps to the door. Someone called her name. Miss Simmons, an attractive woman about Margot's age, offered a cardboard smile. Mr. Master will see you now. Margot followed her down a long corridor. What had she done? Mr. Master was probably a stuffy older man who talked down to her like Jerry. She walked into a spacious office to see a tall man with a head of thick, wavy black hair. He dismissed the secretary and extended his right hand. Edward Master, his athletic body, firm jaw, and bedroom eyes mesmerized her. So much so she forgot the way his calloused fingers made her skin bristle when she shook his hand. This guy was not old, definitely young. He reminded her of Mr. Monero, a history professor in her senior high school. Senior year of high school, he was dreamy. She looked forward to history class so she could stare at him. Stop it, she scolded herself. She'd just been told Uncle Harry had passed away. Out of respect for the departed, she shouldn't indulge in musings. However, Margot couldn't help herself. <clears throat> She'd allow herself one more look and switch her brain to business mode. Master pointed to a chair in front of a mahogany desk filled with engraved crystal awards. Please have a seat. Margot sunk onto the plush leather and crossed her shapely legs. I'm sorry for your loss. From what Mr. Steinberg told me, your Uncle Harry was quite a man. I spent a lot of time with him after my birth father died. He was my favorite relative. I've never had enough money to invest, so this will be a new experience. Mr. Steinberg said I can't tap into my inheritance until I find a full-time job. I hope it will happen soon. Margot could feel her toes curling in her shoes as Master's dimples widened into a smile. First call me Edward. Mr. Master is my grandfather. He founded this firm. I'm the conservative vice president among my colleagues. His voice was so sensuous, his stare intense, as if he could read her mind. First encounters usually didn't have this effect on Margot. Good to know, but can you give me an idea of what I should invest in? He handed her a pad. It would help if you could write down how much you think you'll need to live on for the next two years. We can talk about how to invest the remaining sum. Sounds like a plan. Margot made two columns, one with her wish list filled with the designer clothes she admired every time she walked up Madison Avenue to meet her mother at the store off Fifth, the small boutique where Diana worked as a seamstress. The other necessities of life was for the basics of food, maintenance, and medical insurance. Before handing the pad to Mr. Master, she crossed out her wish list. Seems you're conservative as well. I have to be with student loans to repay. He turned a page in his agenda. I'll do a preliminary profile. When can you come in to discuss it? Margot lost focus. He was so handsome, but this type of guy probably only went out with girls from schools like Vassar. He repeated the question. Miss Simmons, did you hear me? She wanted to say tomorrow, but wouldn't press her luck. Friday is my early day. I could be here by 5.30 if that's okay. See you then. My secretary will show you out. Good luck with your job search. Thanks. He extended his hand. This time it was warm and inviting. She noted the wedding band. She could stop daydreaming. Edward fingered his wedding band. He hated the thought of going home to an empty house. At quitting time, he stopped into a pizza place, grabbed a soda, and walked home. Opening the door of his Sutton Place townhouse, he stepped into an empty cavernous space. He tired of eating alone with only the sound of his voice for company. When Annabelle, his wife of 10 years, was alive, he was happy to be there. <clears throat> In the years since her death, it had become a place to admire art work from their vacations. People visited museums. They didn't live in them. He remembered a time when laughter and music filled each room. Annabelle gave the best parties in town. Her vivacious personality was hard to resist. All traces that a real person lived here had vanished with her passing. At 33, his life was meaningless. 
As he climbed up the stairs to the master bedroom, Edward stopped short of the door. He avoided the king-size bed where he made love to Annabelle and opened a cavernous walk-in closet to finger dresses and gowns. A year ago, they'd been worn by his wife. Now they were remnants of a life snuffed out too soon at 30. Edward's hand felt on Annabelle's favorite, a Dior lavender lace creation. He smiled at the memory of how, how he'd worked the delicate zipper and buttons to uh to fasten to fasten her gown uh he held the silky material to his nose to sniff the lingering essence of her favorite fragrance chanel number no. five he'd never been able to he'd never be able to smell it on her again unable to part with it edward returned the gown to the closet he heard footsteps in the hallway he so wished they were annabelle's there to greet him after a long day at work and caress away cares of the day to his regret his housekeeper appeared in the doorway. Sir, is there anything else you need before I leave for the evening? Can you help me put these clothes into a garment bag? Of course. Halfway out of the bedroom, Edward turned around and placed the clothes back on the rack. He held the garment bag against his cheek. These are all I have left of her. Edward saw the look of sorrow on Emma's face. Begging your pardon, sir, but Mrs. Masters has been gone a year. It's time to let someone else use these clothes. Swept up in the aura of his wife, Edward could only nod. You're right. Tomorrow morning, I'll have Roger take me to the dry cleaner to have them readied for new owners. See you then, sir. He dreaded another night in the house alone. Wait, could we talk a while? Emma shook her head. <clears throat> Sorry, sir, but tonight I must get home. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful reading. I'm really interested to read the rest of your story. Um. Tell me, I know that this story um, is at at its core of the plot is um, the adoption of a recently orphaned young child. What made you want to write about the process of adoption mm -hmm. and um, and this challenge of bringing a child into your world that you don't have a connection to? Well, because I've been doing volunteer work with children since I'm nine years old. I had my little space in the den in our home in New Jersey years ago where I used to tutor children. And I was nine. And I just have such empathy for children who are struggling. And when I was younger, I really did want to be a foster parent, but things never worked out. Mm -hmm. So when I did this story, I wrote this story. I wanted it to be about starting over because as you can glean, Edward can't get over his wife. Sure. Margo it's is, a difficult thing. Oh, it's when you when you love someone and they die of cancer at 30. Yeah. But also Margot has seen only the horrible side of a family because her father died. And now she's stuck with a stepfather who does a lot of things that are really bad. Yeah. So I wanted. I like to bring happiness and I wanted Margot not only to want to be a teacher, which is what she becomes. And then later on much more, but I wanted her to have such empathy for a child. And I also wanted to ch to tell young people because when you and I were growing up, young people had a different agenda mm -hmm. and I wanted to show younger people, Hey, there is a girl out there a young girl who actually feels so bad that the housekeeper of her boss has passed away and this girl is going to go into an orphanage. What a horrible thing. Yeah. I mean, I had a magnificent mother, so the young girl is now going to be taken under the wing of Margot. I think it's a wonderful thing that you're showing a resurgence for those family values in your story. I just think that's a, a really great place to begin writing do you have is, is this book a standalone do you have a series planned what's your next project oh my goodness I thought it was going to be a standalone but when my webmaster looked online he saw so many comments about when are we going to have a sequel so hopefully there will be but right now I have finished book one Good. In my trilogy, my historical suspense, I'm working on book two. And because it does involve the Holocaust and the Holocaust survivors, as you know, are dwindling yes. to my 
deep, deep, deep regret. I need to get those out first, but yeah, uh, no, that's perfectly understandable. And I hope that you will come back at another time and read from that work as well. Oh, I'd love to. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. Thank you.